Good afternoon, QA automation engineers and those who are planning to become one soon. My name is Sergey Kromchenko. I am a founder of the Codemify Bootcamp. I've been teaching and preaching QA for more than nine years. And today I want to share three news with you guys. First of all, we're going to interview two of our ex students and now they're working as the QA automation engineers today we're going to go through 30 interview questions for the QA for a junior QA automation engineer position as you guys have sent us hundreds of requests for that video so we're going to spend approximately an hour answering those questions so you could learn how to answer them in the best way possible news number two one of our students have just received an offer which is 65 bucks an hour which is not bad as the first offer ever but I just wanted to tell you guys that this is an exception because he did not even finish the course he went only through half approximately half of the course and he got an offer already the, once again this is an exception this is not a, something everyone will get if you pay us if you get the course you have to study hell of a bunch you have to work really hard you have to study I mean he studied full-time some of you guys can study part-time but he studied full-time and one more time, this is an exception. Don't expect to get that much money within th that short period of time. And also for people who, who are looking for a job from the outside, you'll get much less just because everyone understands that if you are outside of the US, very likely your spendings are much lesser than here. You don't spend as much money on everything, so you get less money as the salary. And in news number three, we are going to host our free webinar in just a, uh, in three days, if I'm not mistaken. You can follow the link right below this video if you would like to join us. All right, let's get directly to the video. Hey everyone, good to see you guys. Good to see you, Sergi. Hey Sergi, how's it going, man? All good, all good. I'm here in Boston, Massachusetts, living the life, play soccer this morning, but I'm here to interview you guys and, tell, and actually ask you, first of all, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are wondering how do QA automation engineers spend their weekends as Lucas is in Brazil and Anastasia is in Texas. So Anastasia, uh, since you're a lady, let's start with you. How did you spend your weekend? Sure. So I spent a lot of time with... And uh, actually last weekend I was in Boston too. Oh, no way. That's awesome. <laughs> Awesome. I think the sound interrupted for a second. You said you spent this weekend with family, probably? Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Sounds good, sounds good. So key automation engineers also have families and lives. They don't only write code. Uh, Lucas, okay. how about you? Yeah, pretty much the same. I had a uh, had, um, uh, wedding this Saturday from uh, a couple of friends. So mm -hmm. we spent the whole day during the day there and at late at night. So... And today I woke up a little bit later, then went to have lunch with the family, just chilling the afternoon and re reading a little bit. That's it. Awesome. Enjoy. Awesome. Uh, all righty. Thank you for the quick um, semi introduction. I think everyone already knows Lucas. And if you guys do not, I'm going to attach a link to the video right here. And Anastasia, I don't think we've had you on our YouTube channel yet, right? Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us who you are? How did you get here to this video? Yeah, sure. So my name is Anastasia. I'm um, originally from Ukraine, but um, I live in uh, Dallas, Texas um, last six years. And I went through surgery schools um, a year ago, I think, or maybe a year and a half, or maybe two even. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, that was very helpful because, because previously I was learning kind of myself and um, that was like not very structured. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm working as a QA automation engineer last um, 10 months already. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome. So. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, let's feel comfortable. Uh, by the way, uh, you guys are going to all notice that I'm one of those who cannot sit in one spot. You'll always see my jeans popping up because I'm moving my legs, I'm moving my body. I just cannot sit in one place for a long time. <laughs> and I know a lot of people, a lot of people are having fear that they will not 
fit this position or this career as you have to sit in one place and you have to program or write code. But as Lucas is already waving with his head, that's that's not the case. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's not the case at all. I can tell you that. How, how do you do that? How do you handle yourself if you are one of those people that, as my grandpa would say, you're a twister? You are always twisting things around and running around, <laughs> cannot sit in one spot. Yeah, well, one of the things that is good about this position is that the flexibility you have to choose where you want to work. For example, I have my office at my apartment, so I pretty much work every day from here. But there are some days I like to go to a different cafe and just work for, in a different environment or... Uh, Sometimes I have to go to my mother's city and I just go and I can sit in her office or her house and work from there. Then I can have a break in the middle of the day and have a coffee with her and chat a little bit with her and get back to work. So it's never boring. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's amazing. That's amazing. The beauty yeah. of working remote. Uh, awesome. All right. I'm and around the house all the time and sometimes I'm working from my bed if... Uh, if <laughs> If all calls are a video off, so <laughs> that's great. Actually, that's why I, I like this job because I hit gym a lot. I go to, as you guys can see those guns. I'm just kidding. Uh, I hit the gym a lot, and a lot of times I would go to gym on Monday. I would work out for like two three hours, and then I would be dead next day because of the heavy weights. I would be just laying on the bed and typing in the computer all day. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, let's get started. So I got a, I prepared a list of questions uh, for the junior, junior slash mid, I would say mostly for junior, but still a QA automation engineer. Uh, and we will go through those all together. As always, you guys know the drill. Uh, I'll ask the question, whoever wants to answer it, volunteer. If you do not wish to answer, simply just, just don't answer and I'll pick it up myself and I'll answer it. Uh, all right. First and the most important, actually, you know what? This is the question that everyone gets during the interview. But since this is this is the QA uh, automation engineer interview, I think we should ask this question, you guys as well. So tell me about yourself. But it's it's a bit different because now we're just talking about a QA automation interview position, although you always talk about uh, similar things whenever you are answering this question but you know what let's uh, have our gentleman uh, lucas answer the question if you don't mind uh, and then we'll go to the list of the more technical ones yeah sounds good so uh, hey guys my name is lucas uh, i'm based out of brazil i'm qa automation engineer um i took serge's course so everybody knows that already if you look at the other video serge mentioned um I joined this position after coming from the construction engineering um, field. I worked as a construction engineer for many years. Then I decided to change careers and start working in tech to have more uh, freedom in terms of geographic, geographical freedom to choose where I wanted to work from. Uh, so that's pretty much it, how I ended up in this, in this automation world. Uh, and I would say like my my responsibilities as a QA automation engineer include, but are not limited to um, testing the functionalities we, we do. In my company, we do manual testing for, for the functionalities for the releases. So testing the tickets manually, verifying the functionality for the releases, uh, checking for, for bugs, finding bugs, writing bug reports. Uh, right in the test cases for the tickets that we tested to be able to write automation for them after that. Then automating those test cases in, in, an, in an order that makes sense in, in, in terms of um, criticality, in terms of many things, uh, priority and whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. So automating those test cases, also writing uh, the documentation for the team to help junior engineers that are joining the team to know how things are going, how things should be done. Um, <clears throat> what else? Uh, helping to, to improve the efficiency, help to improve um, uh, how we handle automation in our, in our company. Uh, looking sometimes looking maybe for a better framework, for example, how to 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 handle different cases, different types of tests. Um, yeah, coming with coming up with suggestions and things to to improve this, um, whatever. And what else can I say? Hmm. Yeah, joining a lot of meetings <laughs> every day. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Awesome. I think I think you mostly answered about your your job duties overall, but specifically about automation. Do you want to tell us? I would always add that at this company we're using such oh, and yeah. such tools, languages, frameworks. Yeah, it's been a long time since I don't answer this question, so sometimes we forget <laughs> it. Uh, yeah, we in, in my company we had uh, we were using for the past years uh, Selenium WebDriver IO automation framework. And now we are moving to Playwright. So we are working on the migration for all those thousands of test cases to Playwright. So that's a, a ton of work, in, especially because we still need to deal with the automation of all the new functionalities that are coming on every week, every release. So yeah. we have a lot of work in this case. So uh, we are migrating to, to, play, to Playwright right now. We were halfway there. So probably now in the second quarter, we're going to finish the, the migration and we're going to have less work with every driver, we can shut that off. And um, we work as play, as Playwright accepts JavaScript and TypeScript. We mm -hmm. use both. Actually, we're using uh, mostly TypeScript right now because we're trying to uh, to make that a, a general pattern among the, the, the engineering team. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, as test case management tool, we use uh, Jira right now. Jira, Jira has the, a new functionality called the called quality. I never know how to, pre to pronounce that correctly because the way it's written is a little bit strange. <laughs> uh, we were using a uh, test rail before. Now we, we migrated to, to quality, which is uh, mm -hmm. Jira. So Jira has everything right now. So we use Jira for managing the tickets, the bug reports, everything, and also the test cases. So now it's all combined in one, one platform. Interesting. That's awesome. Really That's good. awesome. It's, it improved a lot our, our efficiency with test cases. Yep, yep. Awesome. Great. Thank you for the answer. By the way, guys, if you want to know how do I usually answer this question, the link is going to be attached right here. All right. Now let's follow our list. So first interview question. Well, no, second one. Uh, what is the QA automation and why is it important? That's pretty much a general question uh, that a lot of times you can get for the junior position. So people just want to know what, in your opinion, automation, QA automation is and why is it important? Anyone? I can take that. Sure, let's do that. Let's yeah. go. So, uh, so in testing, uh, we have both manual and automation testing. So the manual testing, as the name says, it's pretty basically doing manually what the functionality described in a ticket uh, ha should be done. Yeah, testing how that should be done manually. So re really going there, clicking, typing, seeing if the things are working. And uh, on the automation side, we're going to use uh, a code uh, language like JavaScript, for example, uh, and an automation framework like Playwright, for example, to do exactly those steps, but in an automated uh, way. So something that we would take, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes to do manually. One test is going to take a minute or less than that. Uh, and this is really important because it helps us to scale our, our testing framework across the company. So as our, our app application grows, our testing has to grow as well. And we cannot uh, uh, have so many engineers to do everything manually for every release, yep. especially because we have to do to deal with regressions. For example, every release, we have to pre-test, we have to test everything that was already developed to check that mm -hmm. the new functionality did not introduce any regression in the application. So we can mm -hmm. do that manually, which takes forever. And we can do that yeah. with, with automation. So we can have all those tests automated to run every release to check that we don't have uh, new bugs uh, coming in. Um, yeah, that pretty much it. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Lucas. That was a good one. OK, and next one will be, um, let's see, the next one is going to be what is the difference between manual testing and automation testing i think you already answered this question just right now so the next one would be how many test cases do you have and how many are automated out of those i guess anastasia you want to take this one yeah sure um so we have 160 samson test cases automated and overall we have around 200 so almost everything is automated. Um, nice. It's mostly because um, I work in a consulting company. Mm -hmm. So it's a um, like short-term project. So yeah. we're 
we'll finish it and just um, handle that framework to the client. Yep, yep. That makes sense. That makes sense. That's a pretty, pretty straightforward answer. Awesome. Thanks a lot. All right. Actually, let me mark those with the, uh, with the check marks so I would know which one I already answered. Okay. And the next one. Uh, how do you choose which task cases to automate? I that one too. Let's go, Anastasia. Yes. Yeah, so first, you will automate main functionality like login. Um, I would say checkout. Um, if it's commerce uh, application uh, search, and then it will also depend on priority. Um, if there is some new functionality that uh, needs to be checked, or also part application that takes um, the long mm -hmm. the longest time to go through manually. Uh, so also kind of stuff like registration, um, maybe like forgot password. So something that will involve uh, sending emails to sending emails and like um, verifying links. Mm -hmm. Also important part. Yep, yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So pretty much uh, regression. Uh, regression runs, right? The, the, those who are taking the longest time and then by priority. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. That makes sense. I can, I can add something to that. Uh, one of the things that is important uh, when developers are, are, are writing code, they also add tests to the functionalities. So mm -hmm. developers are mainly writing unit tests, integration tests, exception tests, uh, which we call lower level tests, right? And we, as QA automation engineers, mostly write end to end tests. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I always do is checking when I check uh, test the ticket, check the PR of the developer, and I see if the developer already wrote any uh, lower level test that covers that functionality. Because sometimes that happens, and sometimes we don't need to add, to add an end to end because it's a it's a maybe sometimes it's a simple functionality and it's not really complex and it's already covered by a lower level test. Then we don't need an end to end because the lower level is going to be much faster than the end to end one. Yep, yep, that's a really good addition to this question. Uh, and if you guys will use it during the interview, the interviewer should probably show you that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Moving forward to the next one. Uh, the next one, uh, what tasks can not be automated or should not be automated? That's a good one. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I, I, I can try to answer that. Um, so tasks that cannot be or should not be automated. One of one of the, the examples is what I just said, like tasks that are already covered, that they ha have a lower level coverage already because it's mm -hmm. just be double work. So you don't need to, to have double double coverage on automation for that. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the tests are, uh, are tests that deal with uh, integrations with different things that are not easy to automate. For example, sometimes you have I don't know, some uh, Microsoft integration with some different uh, tool out of your, your application that it's really hard to automate or sometimes that makes your application, uh, not your application, your test really flaky because mm -hmm. it depends on, on the syncing with, uh, for example, in our company, we have a uh, um, connection with Power BI from Microsoft, right? And it's really hard to automate because Power BI has sometimes different timeouts to sync uh, when you when you change something in the dashboard. And then your tasks, you, you never have like a specific timeout that d handles that, that syncing process. Sometimes it's, it takes longer, it takes lo uh, less time. So the tasks usually are uh, very flaky. So yeah. you spend more time maintaining and, and refactoring those tasks than actually running and checking results. So it's easier to have uh, somebody doing the manual manual tests on that. Um, mm -hmm. That's a good one. What else could not be automated? Let me think. Capture? Yeah, recapture. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Recapture cannot be automated as well. Mm. And what should not be automated? What should not be automated? Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever we work on the new projects, when things are when when we are working on a new UI, which mm -hmm. is will possibly yeah. not stick for a while when it's questionable, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's a good point because uh, you may remember right now 
in the you know in my company we have a big platform it's divided by pods by pods uh, each module of the application is a different pod with QA engineers oh sorry yeah, yeah go ahead. I was going to ask what what is pod and you're explaining yeah. it already yeah pod is like it's one of the modules of the application we, and each pod is a team that has QA engineers developers uh um product managers, tech leads, and everything. Uh, and we have this pod as our like our own small application in the whole application. So we have our own process, our own things going on. And uh, this pod I started, I don't know, maybe eight months ago, I think, mm -hmm. nine months ago. At the beginning, it was very like, it was just, uh, we, we're just creating that new the new module. So like the UI would change like basically every release. We have, would have new things. So at the beginning, we were not automating many stuff. We, we just automated like the critical paths, like the things that we would keep forever. But all the rest, we were just waiting. Okay, let's wait a couple of releases and see uh, how much that will change or if we're going to keep that because we depend on customers uh, using and, and giving us feedback. Okay, we don't like this. Let's change. Let's do something else. So yeah, that would be one of the things we would not automate. Yep, yep. That's a good one. And also probably those test cases which uh, which are easy to test manually but very difficult to automate i think those would be probably the last ones or at least we should deprioritize them in for the automation so they would be at the bottom yeah all righty that was a good one and the next one how many tasks do you automate per day uh anastasia you want to take this one first it will very much depends on the test. Sometimes one test can take uh, like a week or sometimes you can wait for some at some selectors from developers and you can uh, even like freeze your test for a while. But sometimes mm -hmm. you can automate like uh, if tests are very simple uh, or very similar, sometimes you can automate like 10 tests per day. So yeah, that's very different. Yep, yep, fully agree. That's the best answer you can give because it will depend. I remember myself. Uh, actually automating Microsoft integration through the platform for an audit. And it took me a couple of days because it was a long, long ass test case. Uh, and then the other days when I was working for Verizon, I would uh, automate dozens of uh, API tests very easily, pretty much copy, paste, edit, copy, paste, edit, depending on the, on the structure of the response. Uh, all right. And the next one will be, uh, what is a test script and how do you create one in JavaScript? That's a very broad question, I would say, because it, it, it's, it's not specific at all. Like, yeah. what is a test script and how do you create one in JavaScript? It's pro probably if this was asked by developer who've never done test automation. Yeah. <laughs> So, so in my opinion, a test script is just uh, um, uh, like a, so instruction of step by step how you would perform actions like the user would, but in the time, in the uh, organized as a script with code. That in this case is mm -hmm. JavaScript. Uh, so it's just telling the system, okay, you do this and this and this in this order to test this functionality. So this would be a test script. And yep. in order to do that, you have to combine a language model, a language like JavaScript with a test automation framework that can be Selenium Web Driver, can be Playwright, can be Cypress, many, we have many ones, uh, where you would write, for example, a test login, um, and then you would use uh, test navigate to uh, page, whatever, test input uh, login or username, test input, a password, task input, a task click, a login button, and verify, right in the search to verify that the page loaded and that the user could log in. That would be a simple example of that. Yep, yep, perfect. I would answer it exactly in the same way. Uh, all right, let's go to the next one. Let's see. And the next one is going to be on this one. Uh, okay, uh, so since you guys, both of you guys have used Playwright, right? Great. Uh, what are the main features of the Playwright testing framework? I can answer this because I love Playwright so much. 
<laughs> um, oh, awesome. That's going to be another question then afterwards. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. So I think my favorite feature is traces. Um, so after a test run, you can, um, you, you, you don't need like a headed mod actually, because you can review how test run and what actions exactly it will perform. Also on each action, you can click on the source and see what exactly part of code is it. Like where, where is, uh, might be where you can make mistake or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, what else? S yeah, I, I think playwright, playwright, especially with TypeScript, is very powerful combination. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if other frameworks can do that, but uh, I'm also doing, uh, I'm not like testing API directly, but with playwright, they can intercept API response and then compare it to UI. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was never doing it with other frameworks, so I'm not sure if um, like Cypress or WebDriver can do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. So I think Cypress can do that by default, if I'm not mistaken. But WebDriver.io, you have to install Interceptor library unless they have already added it because I haven't used WebDriver.io for a while. Oh, but yeah, that's, that's another thing. Another thing that with Playwright, you don't need to install a lot of things. Uh, Playwright includes, I think, everything. Um, mm -hmm. when, Playwright auto weights for elements. Um, it just makes your life so much easier. So yeah. true. So true. Yeah, yep. one of the things I, I, I like personally about Playwright is the functionality where you can combine lots of different selectors. For example, you have a page, then you have a row, and this row has a, a, a section. And inside the section, you have a button where you have to click. And sometimes it's easier to get like a selector for for all, just for that button, because it has like thousands of buttons with the, like, the same selector, selector in the page. So it would mm -hmm. be able to, to filter by the, the, the bigger selector with the smaller selector with that small button inside it. So you can combine different selectors in a row for, for an action. That's really helpful as well. Nice, that's a pretty good one. Uh, and I think what else do we have there? So the API, as Anastasia said, there's there are a lot of things to use. So API client, uh, the I think the load testing or performance testing tool is also there, right? In Playwright, uh, I never use it. Not sure. Oh. Okay. Okay. We're gonna start, we'll start having some more more performance stuff right now in our company. So probably I'm gonna be studying about that in a, in a few months. Got it. Got it. So also nice is the that Playwright supports uh, multi-browser, so you can run like the same tests in uh, Chrome, in Firefox, in WebKit, for example. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and by by those who are not familiar with WebKit, is Safari, right? Yeah. Thank you. Alrighty, that was a good one. Uh, so then, a follow up, two follow up questions to Anastasia. Uh, that's what usually happens when you answer the question. If you give some interesting information, the interviewer will ask you follow-up questions based on those answers. So what other frameworks are you familiar with? Because you said you like Playwright uh, better than other frameworks. What other ones are you familiar with? Uh, Cypress, WebDriver.io. Um, I think that's all. Yeah, nice. I was very, I was Selenium. Awesome. Uh, sounds good. And why do you prefer uh, WebDriver? Uh, hold on, not a WebDriver. Why do you prefer Playwright versus other ones? So I think I already like um, said that uh, there is yeah. of, you don't need to install a lot of things that you can mm -hmm. install um, other ones. Also, um, I think even Playwright functions are much more developed, um, like click for example in webdriver you know, when i use it last time you can only click so and uh, in playwright um you can do force click you can do the like, left click or right click um you have so much more options for any function that you want to use yep yep so true so true is very handy i love uh, playwright i'm just uh, i'm kind of not intrigued, but I'm in shock that not a lot of people are using it yet. I know mostly Cy Cypress has a better marketing team. They've been in marketing for a while. and But Playwright is definitely a better tool, in my opinion. Uh, also, because 
a playwright is using a sync await, so you would not have to chain a lot of things into one long as callback hell, as it's called. Uh, and that, that's the beauty of a sync await, which is used by playwright, but which is not used by Cypress. But on the other side, Cypress is trying to make things easier, although you are in a callbacks hell when you're using Cypress. And for those who are not familiar with it, we'll record a video later. Uh, okay, Julio, let's move on to the next one. Uh, Lucas, I guess you'll take this one. Explain the difference between end-to-end -end testing and the unit testing. Yeah, sure, I can take that one. So unit tests are usually written by the developers. We as QA automation engineers, I, I don't know any QA automation engineer who has written unit tests. Uh, so unit tests are basically verifying very small units of the code. So when the developer is writing, uh, uh, creating something, writing a function, that unit test is going to verify that that small piece of the, that function is giving the expected output. So it's working as expected. Yeah. So this is a unit test. And an end-to-end test mostly written by a QA automation engineers, verifies the whole flow like a user will do. For example, like I explained before, logging in. Yeah? So yeah, so so the user would go to the page, type the username, type the uh, password, click and log in and verify like the page loaded and the user was, was able to log in. So mm -hmm. it's covering the whole flow of the that the user would do. Yep, yep, that's a pretty good answer. Thank you, Lucas. And the next question would be, how do you organize tests in Playwright? I can take that one. Sure. So I think any programming principles that will apply here, like um, do, do you familiar with try and kiss? So kiss uh, means keep it stupid. Um, so <laughs> yep. anyone can send your code and try um, is don't repeat yourself. Mm -hmm. So that will apply to page object model mm -hmm. um, where you will keep selectors separately and uh, you can also keep your methods separate like and reuse them. Yeah. Um, and also um, um, when you write in spec file, you will mm -hmm. organize your uh, test cases in um, describes, separate describes. Mm -hmm. And you can also organize each test case, um, at least in Playwright. You can mm -hmm. uh, use steps, yeah, and um, like each separate step of the manual test case, for example, will be a separate mm -hmm. step in uh, your code too. Yep, yep, that makes a lot of sense. Awesome, thank you, that was a good one. Uh, okay, and we will not dive into page object model yet. Um, let's... Uh, see what are the advantages of using JavaScript for the test automation. That's a that's a really um, interesting question. Yeah, um, I can. Yeah, I, I, you... I would, yeah I, I can answer that. Yeah, I would say uh, JavaScript has many many advantages. Uh, first thing is that is I think it's the mostly used uh, code language in the world right now. So it has like a, a big uh, a big community talking mm -hmm. about JavaScript. So uh, almost anything you need, uh, you can find in the internet. So if you don't don't know something, you just Google it. Or nowadays you can ask ChatGPT for some help if you want. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can really uh, search for anything that you don't know about JavaScript. That's, that's one thing. Uh, another thing I would say that JavaScript is fairly easy to learn compared to other languages. So you can, if you compare it to Java, it's really easy to learn. You can learn in yeah. a few months. You can try practicing. You have tons of uh, different courses nowadays uh, available. Um, exactly. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'll interrupt here because uh, someone, one of the, our potential students called me recently and he asked, why do you guys teach JavaScript and not Java on, in your course? And my answer was because uh, for the test automation, for, for the test automation, if you will use JavaScript, uh, it's pretty much you would ride a bicycle to get a groceries, just as a human example. If you would use Java to write test automation script, it would be like driving a tank to the grocery store. Why the hell would you drive a tank to the grocery store just to get groceries? 
you'd use JavaScript, use your bicycle, because it's much easier. It's much faster to start with. So that's the reason. And also for the test automation, for the same reason, most of the new companies, they new companies, they are using JavaScript. So the trend looks like this piece of wood right behind me. And yeah. actually, I didn't even need to hold my hand, literally. That's the trend for the JavaScript in the test automation. And, uh, and this is the trend for the Java in test automation, because why would you have to use such a heavyweight language unless you have to work directly with the hardware? Then it would be a bit easier, if I'm not mistaken, to work uh, through the Java, because that's pretty much what it's created for, to uh, program microwave right there, to program uh, TV right there. So that's what Java is for. And JavaScript is one of the easiest languages in the world to learn. And if you guys... We'll take a look at the Stack Overflow uh, annual survey. You'll see that a JavaScript is number one, the most popular and loved language in the world. That's already mentioned. That's true. One other thing is that uh, JavaScript is also very, uh, it's easy to learn, but it's also very, uh, has a, a good versatility. So you can use it for front end and back end. So you can use JavaScript for APIs and for other things from back end as well. Uh, it's easy to use for a synchronous operation, so you can use it very easily to to handle asynchronous programming, which is uh, totally involved in the test automation frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also very used to combine with uh, different automation frameworks. You can use it with uh, Selenium WebDriver IO. You can use it with Play Playwright. We can use it with Cypress. You know. Yep. 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 Exactly. Thank you. That was a good one. All right, next one. What is the role of assertions in automation testing? I can't answer that one. Um, I think assertions are the most uh, part of the test actually, because otherwise so just clicking um, to enter the pages doesn't make any sense. So assertions will verify that you will end up to the page um, that you were looking for, that you see elements that you need to see, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And I can add that one of the most important mistakes of the newbies in test automation uh, is that they write tests, but they don't write assertions. So pretty much your login as the newbie would look like uh, navigate to the page, uh, type in username, type in password, click login, that's it. But how the hell in the world do you know that you have been already logged in and you can see the dashboard? That, that's why we need assertions. Thank you, Anastasia. It was a really good one. Uh, all righty, marking it as done and moving on to the next one. Explain the difference between before, before each, after, and after each hooks in Playwright or any other frameworks because they all use the same hooks. Yeah, I can answer that one. Uh, so when you're writing tests, uh, the tests have different phases. So uh, we have the first phase of the test, which is like setting up the environment we're going to use to test. So sometimes in our in our platform, for example, for my company, we have a lot of uh, permissions that the user needs to have in order to be able to perform some actions. So sometimes in the before hooks, we're going to set those permissions for that user. Uh, sometimes we need to create a specific user or a specific environment to, uh, to, to test. For example, you are creating an audit template and you have to... Uh, create a user that is going to is going to be able to open and edit that audit template. So we we will do that in the before hooks, and then do the the steps that user has to do in the test, and then write the assertion at the end. Uh, and that the after all of that, we're gonna have to clean up all that data that was created because that's a good practice. So mm -hmm. every data, everything we create for the test, we usually try to clean it up after the test. Uh, and the differences between before and before each. Uh, in Playwright, it's called before all and before each, is that if you have uh, in the describe block, if you have a lot of different tests, the, the, the before all or before is going to do that, is going to execute that function, that thing you, you specified only once before all of those, those tests. And if you do a before each, is going to, as the name says, is going to execute that before each of those tests. And the after, or after all, and after each is basically the same thing. One of them executes the, those steps once for everything. The mm -hmm. other one executes for every step, for every test. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for a good explanation, Lucas. Next question. What is a page object model 
And why is it important in task automation? I think I already answered that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you think you did uh, partially, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe there was full answer, I don't remember. Uh, can you please uh, duplicate one more time, just in case? Yeah, sure. So page object model is um, design pattern that you will use um, in your framework. I think it's not just important, it's actually necessary to use that because I couldn't imagine a uh, maintained framework uh, without that. I have never seen a framework without page object model. Uh, mm -hmm. So if, uh, for example, developers do a new design, you can go just to one place and change your selector or change your method and uh, don't like, change it each test where you used it. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, exactly. It's well organized. It's centralized. So as um, as Anastasia mentioned, that we can we keep all the selectors in one place where you, where you can reference them. So you so you wouldn't have to uh, hard code your selectors in the thousands of pay, uh, in the thousands of tasks, and then if code breaks, you would have to change the code in the thousands of pages. You simply make the change in the one page. Thank you, Anastasia. That was a good one. All right, we're slowly running out of questions. So the next one is, uh, how do you handle timeouts in Playwright tests? I think I had this question when I was getting my first test automation job, although that one was about WebDriver IO or even Robot Framework for Python, I don't even remember. But the question is the same, how do you handle timeouts? I can try to answer it. Uh, so uh, not sure if I get completely what what they want to, to know about, the, about this question, but uh, the timeout usually, um, can happen like the timeout error in this case, like for example, a test uh, didn't complete running because uh, something happened and it had the timeout. Uh, so the timeout is configured uh, when you are uh, or setting the playwright automation framework, you can have in the global configuration file, you can set a specific timeout that is gonna be the default for every task. For example, I don't know, uh, one minute or whatever, that every task is gonna take maximum that time. And mm -hmm. uh, if it takes more than that, the test times out, which is good to, to have that set up because um, the test, if the test is taking much more than that, that can indicate a problem that has to be taken mm -hmm. some action upon. So that's really uh, useful. Uh, but you can also, if you need, uh, you can set a specific timeout for, for a different task. In the test itself, you can use the set timeout uh, function to, to set a different task than the default one. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that can help because sometimes you, if you don't want to change the default timeout for the whole for the whole thousands of tests you have, you just have one. Okay, I know this test is going to take longer because of, I don't know, whatever, something happens or is is longer than the average. So, okay, this test is gonna have need the timeout longer than mm -hmm. the other one. Um, and you can also uh, set specific timeouts in the test itself, because sometimes it's it's not that, I personally don't like to hard code timeouts in the test. Uh, I prefer to, to use a wait, like a wait for something that, uh, for example, I'm navigating to a page and I need to, that, something from that page to show up before executing some action. So I prefer to use this kind of, uh, of, of, of awaits, but sometimes you need to use uh, a specific timeout. So you can use, for example, wait for a timeout uh, a number of seconds, uh, and then the test is going to pause on that timeout, wait for, the, for those seconds and then keep running. So sometimes you need some, some, some other asynchronous operation to finish before keeping the test running. And that's that's really helpful to use. Yep. yep. Answer the chat, the question. I, I can add to that. I, I have some kind of life hack for that. Um, I had that situation uh, for mobile uh, browser test performance slower. So instead of adding wait um, adding hard coded uh, weights, I was adding some extra clicks just mm -hmm. like verify that click here. So I I had like one second of time and uh, that worked for that kind of situation. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, different. I different. agree that adding uh, hard-coded weights is not uh, best practice, right, in these cases. Yep, yep, that's for sure. Thank you both. <clears throat> awesome, and by the way, this was one of the questions that you guys can, uh, can learn the answers to, but as you've heard from Anastasia, there will be cases from your own experience. And a lot of people who are looking for the first job, 
uh, what are they mostly missing is experience. So you have to get that experience somehow before you go for an interview. Otherwise, you will not be able to get it. You have to either find a company that you can uh, work for as your, uh, for free, find a company that will take you as an intern. But I would doubt it because there are thousands of people like you who want to get it, who want to get a free internship just to get experience so you could get it money later. So uh, I would recommend you guys to, number one, find the friend who has a company or find a course that uh, offers you the experience uh, working in a company. And if you guys are interested, I'm going to attach a link right below this video so you could learn more information about that. All right, moving on after a short advertisement. Uh, how do you deal with the test test flakiness? Actually, that's a good one. That's the one that I had I had to answer about four times out of 30 interviews that I had in my life. I can answer that one. Let's go. So I think there's different reasons for test flakiness. Uh, sometimes it might be related to your code. Um, you can write it better and uh, make tests not flaky, actually. But mm -hmm. also, sometimes it will be related to the um, website performance, for example. Mm -hmm. Then uh, how we are dealing, dealing with it on my current project, um, in, we use in CircleCI as CACD. So we rerun the tests that have failed. And uh, a lot of times, uh, at least half of them will pass. And um, in report, they will be marked as a flaky test. Mm -hmm. And then um, if you are able to avoid some of like some of the pieces of the code that you uh, that um, why test is actually flaky, mm -hmm. if you can rewrite your uh, code to make it better, that it will be nice. Stuff. But if uh, it is not possible, then um, I think this test will remain flaky. <laughs> Yep, yep, rerun mostly is the best solution. Or as you mentioned, just try to rewrite the code, try to dig into the issue. I try to debug it and find why is it failing. Lucas? Yeah, I can try to, to also him, uh, help to answer because that's a pretty good question because we deal with test flakiness. Like everybody, every QA automation engineer is going to deal with test flakiness in their life. So it's good to know how to deal with that. Uh, Playwright is actually, as we are talking about this framework, is very good because it's, as Anastasia says, it, it has this built-in built uh, awaits before performing actions. So if you are using autom an automation framework that doesn't have that, one of the things to do, for example, before clicking on something, you're going to wait for that to be visible and stable, and then you can click on that because sometimes the page takes some longer time to load and the, the try to perform the action to click before the element was was uh, visible. So if the automation framework doesn't have this functionality, add those uh, uh, waiting for the element to be visible uh, or something like that before performing an action. Sometimes the tests run too fast and then uh, they fail because of that. So in, we use that also in Playwright, for example, when typing something in a text field, you can uh, use a delay so it would type slowly like a user would do, not like instantaneously, mm -hmm. and that makes, yeah. makes the task more stable. Uh, it also is very good to use unique selectors. So try to, try to not use like uh, XPath or, or actually avoid totally this kind of things, especially if you uh, want to set table test. Always try to stick to unique IDs like ID or sometimes the class. In my company, we have uh, we are adding data QIDs. So what we do, the developers write specific data QIDs, specific uh, selectors that we can use for each part of the code or each mm -hmm. of everything they are writing. So we can use that in the test and that's totally unique. So that makes the test more stable as well. Yep, yep, that's a good one, that's a good one. And also if you guys who are gonna be watching this video have other opinion about an XPath, if you think it's powerful thing and you wanna use it, Please leave a comment below. I want to hear why, because I have that opinion that sometimes it's more useful to use XPath. And if you know how to use it, it's it's we're very powerful. But Playwright has actually brought up a couple of new uh, helpers. In or and though by using those helpers, your CSS will be as powerful as, as XPath is. But it's not a conversation for the junior QA automation position. Uh, we will discuss it later on in a separate video. Thank you. Moving forward. All right. Um, what are some common challenges 
Uh, let's see, what are some common challenges that you have faced when implementing the test automation? Hmm. Let me think. Common challenges. I guess from my experience, that would be finding selectors in case nobody added and the website is very uh, automated uh, in a form of UI that is generated dynamically. Most of the selectors generated dynamically, so that would be an issue. The other issue would be uh, weights. So if the automation runs, I think previous conversation that we've talked about, the flake test flakiness answered this one quite a lot uh, because most challenges will be related to the test flakiness. But the challenge all the way at the beginning of test autom automation framework creation is what to choose, which framework to go with. Uh, and when you're choosing one, you need, to, yeah, you need to know what application you're going to use, what are the aspects of it, so you would know what framework to choose. And when you choose your framework, then how to set it up and train your team in case your team does not know how to write automation or how to work with this specific framework, I guess. But everyone yeah, I would say, uh, as, as we talked before, also uh, what to automate. That's a that's a good thing because you cannot automate everything. So mm -hmm. choosing the, the right task is to be automated is also a very critical step in the implementation of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and everyone will actually have once again. This is why it is important to have experience before you go for an interview, uh, because everyone will have their own answer. My answer would be the most uh, the most challenging. Uh, let's see, common challenges uh, when when I was writing automation is creating test automation infrastructure for my team. It took me a couple of months because I did create it from scratch, scratch, utilize AWS. I did things that I never did in my life. I did things that none of the engineers, even developers in my company ever did in their lives. So it took me a couple of months and quite a lot of nights with coffee <laughs> and sugar. <laughs> But once again, everyone will have their own answers to this question. Um, all right, let's switch to the next one. How do you perform cross-browser testing using Playwright? I think Lucas, Lucas already touched this one, right? Yeah, yeah, because uh, Playwright has its, like, uh, as a built-in functionality, it also, it already has this option of uh, testing in different browsers. So you can use the same tests running in Chromium in uh, Play. In, WebKit with Safari or Firefox. So as we use this framework, that's how we handle it. So easy peasy, play right. There we go. <laughs> All righty. Mm -hmm. oh, let's see. Mm -hmm. How do you simulate user interactions like clicking, typing, or searching options in Playwright? I guess that's a general question. Yeah, I would agree with that one. Uh, yeah, anyone want to take it? That's a very easy question. I think you will just use um, click method, fill, or type. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this, this question pretty much uh, will find out if you've ever used Playwright or you just said you've used it, as some people will do who did not learn it but specify it in their resume <laughs> already. And the next one, how do you debug a fail test in Playwright? That's a good one. That's a good one. You want to take that outside this? No, if not, I can, I can take it. Yeah, I, I, I can answer that. Uh, so in Playwright, you will use trace most likely because you can see exactly all the steps uh, your test went. And um, as, as I already mentioned, you also on each step, you can see exact piece of code um, that was executed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And now and you can also, if I can combine my answer with yours, uh, you can also use uh, test pause. You can uh, ask the, 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 the browser to pause at some specific step of the test. Uh, so it's going to open the debugging console and you're going to be able to, to use it. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you can write the test from the beginning in the debug mode using uh, slash slash debug. So it's going to start running the test uh, with the debugger open and you're going to have to uh, click and and the test is going to show you step by step what, what it's doing, which code is being used on that function, and everything. So 
Yep, also, yep. from my experience, a lot of times uh, tests will pass in debug mode and will not pass because it's running um, much faster when it, yeah. when you are not using debug mode, and then you will need to figure out what to do. Exactly, exactly. That's a good one. That's a really good one. And honestly, in these cases, the good old console log comes handy. <laughs> I like to use that one a lot uh, when possible, uh, but debug mode of playwright is an equivalent of debug method of the web driver io i believe it's a very similar thing where you could also stop it stop the code execution see what's happening um uh, and you could actually execute at least in web driver io you could stop the code and you could keep executing web driver io methods upon selectors uh in through the terminal i think it's called REPL, where you are using the code in a terminal during the execution so you could see that element is existing or is clickable or is visible right at this moment that was very helpful yeah uh, that's for sure and also the console as you mentioned is also uh, i forgot about that it's very helpful especially for example if you're uh, uh writing some something that has an api call and you have to use the response from that api call <clears throat> to interact with, for example, I, I I created an element and that that API call is good is going to generate an, an element with an ID and I used to grab the ID of that element to uh, to interact with it to to navigate to some page that used that ID in the URL or something like that and then uh, you can use console log to to verify, for example, that that API call is actually giving you the JSON file that you expect to grab that information from. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And. This answer is uh, awesome. All three of us did a great job. And I want to remind everyone to hit the big fat thumb up button right below this video. Hit the subscribe button. And let's move on to the next question. Just another second of advertisement. <coughs> All right. And the next one. How do you handle API testing in JavaScript? That's a good one. I can, so, not, yeah, or Lucas, you can go ahead. Um, or we can both answer that one, I think, because uh, I wanted to say that um, on the current project, we are not actually, we are not doing um, API testing, but we are, as I mentioned, uh, intercepting API responses and uh, then data that we get from API to what we mm -hmm. see in your Exactly. And that's a really good answer because I want I want everyone to understand that it is okay to say that I do not know. I have not done API testing with this project or even at all. I've never done it, but I learned something or I've been using it partially in this and those situations. That's completely okay. We cannot know everything because we're human. Yeah. Let's throw it. Yeah, in my in my company, uh, we as QA engineers, we are not writing much of the the, the API tests are mostly written written by developers right now. So, uh, but we are gonna start writing more because uh, we're trying to stick to the end to end tests uh, only to cover like end user flows, like mostly uh, some happy paths of the of the users, and mm -hmm. and let all the rest to be covered by lower level tests. And if you, if everybody uh, right watching this video is good to understand the, the concept of the test pyramid. So we're not, we don't want to write so much end to end tests because they are costly. They are easy to, to maintain They're Yeah. So they take a long time to debug. So yeah. So we, we're going to start right now writing lower, um, uh, less end to end tests and more uh, lower level tests. And some of them are going to be API tests. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we're going to be, be using uh, the functionality of Playwright for that because it's very helpful. You can exactly, exactly. Playwright to write any, any, any HTTP call uh, to, to do whatever you want. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for your answer. Uh, and the next one, explain. Let's see. No, not this one. Mm, not that one. How do you use custom commands in Playwright? That's a good one if you have used those. That's a good one if you have not, because you will simply say that I have not, but I know you can use them. It's easy to Google. You navigate your Playwright website and read an official documentation, copy, paste, edit, create it, use it. Boom, killed it. Uh, did you guys have any experience with the custom uh, Playwright comments? I never use, I think. Awesome. Moving forward, I already answered it. 
Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, so we're almost done, guys, by the way. Mm -hmm. How do you perform parallel testing in Playwright? That's also an easy question. So you will just put uh, describe or I think test actually test that parallel before the test. Um, that's all. And then these tests will run in parallel. Oh, nice. Interesting. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And also set the number of workers you want to use for testing. So if you especially well, on the on the command line when you're writing the playwright uh, test, you can specify uh, slash slash workers equals to two, three, four. So the test is going to run in multiple workers at the same time. Awesome. And for those people who do not know what work what worker is, please leave a comment below. Uh, we'll explain that on the next video. All righty, and we've got a couple more. Actually. I think we are pretty much done in this case. Yeah, I think we've uh, we've covered all the questions that I wanted to cover. Nice. That's cool. Good. In this case, I'm going to ask you guys only one simple question at the end. If you would ever have to start again from scratch, if you would ever have to start learning QA uh, automation from scratch, what would you do differently? I I think I would um, start learn in uh, Academify earlier. I wouldn't waste uh, so much time on trying to learn uh, myself and also with different schools. By the way, that's that's not a paid advertisement. FYI, <laughs> I did not tell her to say anything. <laughs> yeah, I actually I um, had two offers before I. Um, finished um like my, my course but mm -hmm. um i had some um like family stuff so i couldn't start working right away but um, yeah i just wanted to mention that um learning in surgery course is very helpful so you can get your offer before you even finish the course not for everyone i'll be honest uh, that's true that's true it's possible actually one of our students did uh, today, uh, he told me that he got an offer and he did. He went through, I believe, two months and a half or three months of education. The total amount of months is five months. It takes you to become a key automation engineer with us. But he went through three months and he already got a job offer. But same thing as Anastasia. This is, these are rare cases. You have to be, uh, you have to study quite a lot. You have to match the company's culture, personality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get job that quickly. It's not everyone, every single person in the world who will sign up for the course, will give me money, will get the job right away, or even will get a job at all. Because this is up to you guys. If you work your ass off, if you work really hard, if you do your best and listen to what I say, very likely you will get a job very soon. But I cannot tell you how fast because it mostly depends on you, not on me. I'm giving all my knowledge to everyone. But the question is, can you accept it? So once again, thank you for your good words, Anastasia. But not everyone can get an offer that quickly, although some people can do, can do as we can see. Yeah. Lucas, how about you? Yeah, in my in my case, I <clears throat> I didn't go uh, I didn't go to other schools before. I just joined Codemify directly, and that was a very wise decision because it gave me everything I needed uh, to get a job offer two weeks before finishing the course. So, this guy, <laughs> damn it! All right, except the Codemify because I don't uh, I don't want people to think that this is like a paid advertisement. Except Codemify, what would you take do differently about learning things uh, or yeah? Yeah, that, that was uh, what I was about to say is that except the course, um, I would have started studying JavaScript first, uh, not first, but beforehand, like studying more JavaScript because it takes a bit a bit of time and practice, not, not just time, but you have to practice to get comfortable with it. So at the beginning, okay, you, you, you go through a course, you learn it, but only when you start applying it and practicing daily, you really mm -hmm. get comfortable and get experience with it. So I would start studying JavaScript and practicing um, earlier. Uh, and I would also start applying to interviews more often because this is one of the things that really makes a difference when we're getting a job offer is how much you are applying to job opportunities. So mm -hmm. I would apply 
to more and more and more uh, job offers and uh, job opportunities and go to as much interviews as I could because the more you go to interviews is pretty much the same as learning JavaScript, the more comfortable you get. So after you've gone through, I don't know, 10, 15 interviews, the, the, the 16th, the 17th one is going to be easier and easier and easier. So I would do that. Yep, yep. That's a really good one. Actually, this reminds me, one of the questions that some of the people have asked our uh, previous YouTube uh, interviewees who I've interviewed, uh, one of, I believe, uh, Ella or someone else got a question from the person saying that, hey, what am I doing wrong? I applied for 40 positions and I did not get a job offer yet. <laughs> you guys are laughing. I'm laughing because what the hell is going on? 40 applications. Are you kidding me? Veronica, one of our first students, actually, she was our uh, she was our mentor for a while in at Comify School. And she had to apply six hundred times before she got her offer. Now she's a senior product at one of the biggest uh, streaming companies in the U.S. But six hundred applications—that's not forty. So whatever you're doing wrong, I mean, I know you're doing wrong. You are not applying enough. As Lucas I mentioned, you have to apply quite more often. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think I'm still uh, receiving messages from LinkedIn that uh, my application was reviewed and it's been <laughs> here <laughs> since then. Whoa, that's amazing. Yeah, it take, for some companies, it takes a while. And by the way, secret about a student who, recent, student who recently got a job, uh, he did a, start applying for a job as soon as he started the course. He was just applying for jobs. And then at the middle of the uh, at the middle of the course, he already comes out with a with a job offer and says, "You know what? I'll be still visiting classes, but mostly, I'm done." <laughs> yeah, you gotta have you gotta have a bit of confidence to do that because everybody who joins the course, I know, I know by me because I was like, not at the at the middle of the course, I was not confident I could get a job offer at all. So I was like, oh, yeah. man, should I really apply? I don't know if I'm." But don't <laughs> don't worry about that, you know, because. You don't need to go to the job offers like really. I need to depend on this one. I need to get mm -hmm. hired. But I'll just go because of the experience of going through the interview. Do your best. Get experience with the questions that are gonna ask you. Write them down. Like after the interview, write the questions uh, that they they ask you, so you can have like a, a backlog of questions to study later. Uh, and just just go with it. Just practice and get experience. And sometimes you're gonna get an offer. That's that's how it goes. Exactly. And watch our videos because you can learn a lot here. Plus, if you guys want to learn how to become a QA engineer on your own, here's a video of self-education. Oops, right here, right here, right there. Uh, and also, if you, uh, for all of our students who are signing up for the course early, uh, I mean, my advice is to sign up early if you're planning to sign, uh, sign up at all, uh, because you're getting a list of pre-educational materials. What I've done when I was becoming a QA engineer nine years ago, I have started to study about a half a year before I went for the course because I was afraid that I'm going to be one of the dumbest ones in a class. I was like, probably everyone is the engineer or already programmer and they're going for a QA position and I'm only going to be a farm boy uh, out of everyone. So I did start to study because I thought I was going to be the dumbest. But half a year later, when I went for the course, I was like, I'm one of the smartest here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> So that's my advice. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining. It was a pleasure to see you, Anastasia, and you, Lucas. Uh, I think people have learned a hell of a bunch of information. And do you guys mind if I'll leave your Instagram or Telegram or LinkedIn profiles down below so they could message you? Because some people think we're fake. <laughs> no, of course not. Please, please do that. We're so, deep fakes. Thank you very much, thank you very much man, for, for the opportunity. It's really helpful to, for us also to, to come here and talk a bit. It's also very good to, to refresh th things in the memory practice. It's always fun. Exactly, exactly. Thank you all. And I hope to see you soon on the next YouTube video. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. man. Awesome. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. In fact, I do know you did enjoy this video. And if you did or did not, you can leave a comment below and tell us what did you not like or what did you enjoy. And also, if you have any questions, if you are not able to find a job or if you are, are interested in the course in becoming a QA automation engineer or in getting actual real life experience, feel free to reach out to me by following the link to our website, which is codemify.com hit the about section and you'll see a phone number which you can use to reach me out. All right, thank you all and you have an amazing day. I'll see you next time.